We know there are plenty of things we can do to spare the Earth carbon emissions, like switching the light bulbs in our homes. A compact fluorescent bulb uses one quarter of the energy of a regular bulb, so by switching all of their bulbs, a typical household in a place like Chicago could reduce its annual energy usage by 2 million BTUs. But what if there was something in your life that used 50 times as much energy as light bulbs? And convenient technology allowed you to cut those emissions by half or more. Would you be interested in that technology? Well, that technology exists. Its basic components have been around for centuries, and millions of Americans use it today to live low-carbon lives. The many ways that your neighborhood influences carbon emissions in the broader environment may surprise you. Traditional urban neighborhoods have a range of residences, from cottages to townhouses to lofts. Features such as shared walls and unit size for families small, medium, and large make for efficient heating and cooling, especially when compared with neighborhoods where houses are one size fits all. Traditional urban neighborhoods have many convenient ways to get around. But in most places, the design of the community offers people just one way to get anywhere. At a time of soaring gas prices, these communities are completely dependent on cars to meet their daily needs. They increase the pain people feel at the pump and the pain they inflict on the planet. The average household in the United States has two cars or trucks and drives them 21,250 miles per year. That's almost one time around the Earth per family. With all this driving, the average family burns a serious amount of expensive gas, emits a lot of carbon emissions, and uses 50 times more energy than on light bulbs. Multiply that by 100 million households, and you see one of the main reasons why the U.S. has one of the highest rates of carbon emissions in the world. People in walkable mixed-use neighborhoods often wind up driving half as much or less than the national average. They walk more, they bike more, they often commute by transit. They're more physically active and they generate far less carbon than average. If the garden center is around the corner, a stroller or a wheelbarrow is an easy way to get things home. Downtown Evanston in suburban Chicago is a fast-growing, low-carbon neighborhood. People in this attractive community do about 45% less driving than the average Chicago area household, according to one peer-reviewed report. They do 62% less driving than the national average. And these patterns hold across metro areas. Average households in Chicago's exurbs generate 11.5 tons of carbon per year with their cars and trucks. Yet households in many suburbs along rail lines generate at least 25% less. And people in near-end neighborhoods generate just 2.5 tons of carbon per year with their cars and trucks. That's one quarter of the carbon per year of households in the exurbs. The bad news is that the U.S. forgot how to build these low-carbon neighborhoods during the second half of the 20th century. Zoning laws made it illegal to build them. Transportation departments built freeways, arterials, and cul-de-sacs, not walkable streets with sidewalks. From a low-carbon technology perspective, we regressed. Fortunately, there's a movement of people, architects, planners, developers, mayors, citizens like you, working to build and rebuild these neighborhoods again. With their smart growth partners, new urbanists are removing barriers that prevent walkable development. They are reforming zoning codes to encourage tight-knit, vibrant neighborhoods. They are replacing blighting urban freeways with boulevards and avenues that bring neighborhoods back to life. They are making plans for sustainable regions where settings range from farmlands and rural reserves to town centers and downtown cores. They are designing innovative green buildings for these green neighborhoods. As a result, low carbon neighborhoods are making a comeback. The comeback is a strong one, mostly because people love these neighborhoods. These sunny courtyard apartments in Pasadena, California are just a block from a bookshop and a Target store. Studies estimate residents drive about half as much as the average Los Angelino. 
when Atlantic Station rose on the site of a closed steel plant near the heart of Atlanta, projections said the average Atlantic Station resident would drive 25 miles per day, nine miles less than the average Atlanta. Today, residents of Atlantic Station drive just eight miles per day, according to the US EPA. People there have more time and more cash in their pockets to enjoy their neighborhoods and their lives. Now, the US will need more than 50 million new housing units by 2030 to shelter a growing population. Yet leading demographer Arthur C. Nelson of Virginia Tech University says the country is overbuilt with homes in large lot subdivisions. Join us at cnu.org.